Palisade Radio is brought to you by First Majestic Silver Corp., one of the world's purest and fastest growing silver mining companies. Welcome back to another episode of Palisade Radio and returning on the show with us today is a favorite of our listeners, Mr. Gerald Salente, publisher of the Trends Journal. Gerald, welcome back to the program. Uh, thanks for having me back. Trends are all about identifying the major movements, shifts, or changes around the world, and 2016 has certainly ushered in a new environment whereby we've seen the stock market beginning to top off and the negatively correlated commodities market, which of course has been in turmoil the last three or four years, uh, particularly the precious metals, have at the same time shown a pretty strong move upwards, indicating a bottom is in place. Do you see a major shift in these markets happening in 2016? Well, on the gold market, the precious metals, uh, it's interesting. It's, uh, gold is up probably about 18% uh, since the start of the year, while most other the commodities, well, they're going up now, but mostly down. I mean, oil's moving up, but that's really based upon whether or not they could keep production where it is and uh, not put more oil into the market. So it has really nothing to do with the fundamentals of the economy. It has to do with manipulation. On the equity market front, I mean, just look what's going on. I mean, earlier this week, uh, the World Bank downgraded world growth. Then the IMF came out again, again and again and again, keeps downgrading growth potential. There's a global recession going on and people don't want to call it what it is. The markets are being juiced up, the equity markets, by negative interest rates, and zero interest rate policy or thereabouts. And you look in the, in the states, for example, you're looking at the equity markets, they're buying up stock buybacks at about the tune of $60 billion a month. So the equity markets have gone up because of the stock buybacks, which is unprecedented at this level because they're borrowing the money for nothing, and merger and acquisition activity. End of story. And you can, these are the facts. In the states, 90%, 95% of the wealth created since quantitative easing and zero interest rate policy began back at the Great Recession has gone to 1%. And when you look at real wages and earnings in the states, the middle class is now a minority and 51% of the people are earning under $30,000 a year. So there is no recovery. The global equity markets are teetering. And you look at, you know what's really important, Colin, is to follow the money. And when I say that, look at bank stocks. In the states, bank stocks are down about 13%. They're coming out with new earnings and they stink. You look, go take a trip over to Europe. About 20% of the equity in the banks has gone into the energy sector. And the energy sectors are in trouble. But it's not only energy, it's shipping because you've got to transport the stuff. And then you keep going on and on. And you look at exports numbers coming out of China. Look at steel prices. It's a global recession. All right. Well, I want to ask you, what happens, Gerald, if a stock market crash does come? Uh, we had Robert Kiyosaki on the show a few months back, and he predicted the worst stock market crash in history would come in 2016. Uh, I don't know if that will be the case, but certainly the Federal Reserve cannot sit idly by watching as all their hard work comes crashing down. Well, here was the cover of our Trends Journal for the winter edition. came out, actually reported it first in December, the panic of 2016. And... The Federal Reserve can't do anything anymore other than more quantitative easing. Zero interest rate policy is not working. Neither is quantitative easing. Take a look over in the European Central Bank. They increased um, uh, equity buying, bond buying, uh, not only corp uh, uh, government bonds, but s they're buying corporate bonds. That's called the merger of state and corporate powers. And back in Europe, Mussolini called it fascism. They just increased it from 60 billion euros a month to 80 billion. Yet you still have Europe, you know, barely growing and, and, and most of the, the southern countries really in recession. So there's nothing really that the Federal Reserve can do anymore other than shoot blanks. And of course, they will try something. 
They come up with new schemes undreamed of. I mean, here we are talking negative interest rates. I mean, in the history of the world, there's never been such a thing. They're making this stuff up as they're going along. And who does it hurt? It hurts we, the little people. Because as I mentioned, all that cheap money allows stock buybacks and mergers and acquisitions so the big could get bigger, fatter, and filthier rich. Where does it hurt the people? How about pension funds? How about savings accounts? You have nowhere to put your dough anymore because they're paying you nothing or you have to pay them to keep it there. So going back to the crash, yeah, there's a strong possibility of a crash and that's why we're bullish on gold. And our forecast for gold is this. Gold needs to move to $1,400 an ounce. That means it has to stay strong above the 1270, 1280, 1290 mark to move into the 1300 level. When it hits 1400 and stabilizes above that, flirting with, you know, 1480, 1460, even 1440, the next hit for us is the $2,000 range because we believe there's going to be a spike in gold when gold prices go up because what gold is is a safe haven asset. It has since the beginning of the written word and it's not going away because Warren Buffett doesn't like it. It's bigger than Buffett, but I know the guy got billions, so hey, take it easy. Yeah, gold's been around forever. It's not going anywhere, and the central banksters could try to bring it down as much as they want, and money junkies that need the, the monetary you know, stimulation, the cocaine and the heroin addiction in, in money form so they could keep their Ponzi scheme going, it's going to die just as the addict dies. That's all this is. It's an addiction. An addiction fed by a criminal group that the people like to call the central bankers. Listen, nothing's changed since the days of Jesus Christ picking up a whip and driving the money changes out of the temple. So when anybody says to me, you know, Mr. Salenti, you shouldn't sound angry or raise your voice. I say, Junior, check it out, man. If the Prince of Peace could become violent because scum are screwing the people, I could get angry. Well, Gerald, that's a good point. And the stated mandate of the Fed has been to bring unemployment to below 5% and to bring inflation up to 2%. They've, of course, struggled over the last couple of years to get that inflation to be seen in their metrics. But all of a sudden, it's creeping up. And there's been reports coming out of different Fed chairs uh, that inflation is probably above the 2% metric now, which raises an interesting question. If the Fed wants inflation at 2% or above, that means the Fed wants gold prices to go up. Maybe not at a ridiculous amount, but it's nice to be on the right side of the trade. Do you agree with that? Well, I don't know if they want gold prices to go up. And this whole 2% inflation thing is a made-up thing. You don't learn this one in Economics 101. They just made this crap up. It's a deflationary cycle because the cost of everything is going down in terms of raw materials. The cost of living is going up. They're rigging the CPI numbers. It started on the slick Willie Clinton. So if you were buying steak and you can't afford steak and now you're buying ground beef, you're still buying steak in their minds. There's been no inflation. So they also that they do this to keep the cost of living index at zero or declining so they don't have to pay people that retired and are getting Social Security more money. The whole game is rigged. And this 2% inflation thing is a totally made up metric. There's no basis for it at all. It began with, with Japan and then the European Central Bank. And the European Central Bank had a 2% inflation cap when they began the Euro group back in the 90s because inflation was running at over 5%. So they said that a nation in the Euro group couldn't exceed a 2% cap. Isn't inflation great? Yeah, we're all making less money, our jobs suck, and they want more inflation? Uh, they're a bunch of sick people, man, with a track record of nothing but failure. And all you have to do is look at the Fed minutes, which here in the land of freedom 
and democracy, which they slaughter people all over the world to bring, we're not allowed to look at the minutes until five years later. So you can't look and remember what a bunch of screw-ups and jerks these people are. So they're making this stuff up. Well, Gerald, you've come to the conclusion that one of the best ways to protect yourself is by holding gold. And as you probably are quite aware, the gold stocks, the equities related to gold, as a, and as an extension of that, many commodity-related stocks have been on a tear the last couple of months. Uh, as gold has moved up a couple hundred dollars, you've had the main index of gold stocks go up over 100%. Uh, you know, with a, with a prediction that gold could be at $2,000 an ounce, it begs the question, do you have any interest in speculating in the gold stocks, or do you just like holding the physical metal? I just like holding the physical metal because I don't know what's going on in behind the curtains with a company. And I'm not a speculator. I buy to hold. And I bought my first buy of gold, by the way, in 1978 at $187.50 an ounce. So I just buy and I hold. And I hold it for my old age, which is creeping up real fast, you know. So that's what me is. Gold is for the golden age. With so much turmoil around the world, you've identified gold, obviously, as a safe haven. Uh, I wouldn't imagine you want to put your money anywhere near the stock or the bond market. Where else are you investing your money? Well, the way I invest my money, and again, I don't give financial advice. You know, I'm up here in Colonial Kingston, New York. This was the first capital of New York, uh, of New York State. And 90% of America's Constitution came from the Constitution that was written right across the street from where we are right now. I mention that because I own three of the buildings on the most historic corner in America. It's um, the only place where there are pre-revolutionary war stone buildings on each corner. So I buy for beauty and integrity. And I buy these because, you know, I'm a, uh, a freedom fighter for peace. So being that the seeds of democracy were sown here, and I know all the terrible things America has done, particularly the slaughter and genocide of the the Native Americans. The Constitution, in what, it, in what it's written about, and the Bill of Rights and what it gives, to me that's worth fighting for. Because I always say that my blood is Italian, but my heart's American. So in the sense that I can never have been me if I was born in Alta Villa Erpino, Vica Quenza, where the, the family came from, and they rest in peace. So I buy for beauty, and for the integrity and the belief of what I'm doing and why I do it. So as a freedom fighter for peace and a warrior for truth, that's where I invest my other parts of my money, in, 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 in beauty and joy. And to me, that's the way of uh, an antidote to fear and to push more positive movements forward. There are a spectrum of beliefs on what will come from this global depression that you've identified on the front cover of your Trends Journal for the winter edition that just came out. And some see another repeat of the 2008 crisis, which, uh, you know, was quite severe, of course, but others see something far worse coming out of it, like uh, a world war or potentially even civil war in the United States with the government against the people. You've stated that we're already in a world war and have been in World War III for quite some time. What do you think 2016 will lend to what's already going on? Well, I, by the way, I agree that this crash that's going to come will be far worse than the panic of 2008. And the, you know, you're looking at uh, levels, for example, in China, where they had uh, $500 billion in debt and credit uh, back 20 years ago, and now it's up to 30 trillion. And you have ghost cities all over the place, 70 million vacant dwellings, 70 million in a poisoned area. You know, the water pollution there, the air pollution. And so what you have is a decline with no end in sight. There's no way they're going to get out of this thing. And the debt bubble in, in, on, in total is about 200 and 25 trillion dollars. So again, just looking at China going from 500 billion to 30 trillion, and now a debt bubble at about 225 to 250 trillion, the crash is going to be, it'll, it'll leave very few alive in terms of financial security. 
Now, when all else fails, they take you to war. And that's what I see happening. And you can see how easily it happens. Look what happened in France when they had the terror strike. All of a sudden, bam, there go your rights. And now you got soldiers work, walking around everywhere. Same thing in Brussels. Same thing in the United States. If we have a terror strike in the United States, false flag or real, they'll, they'll blame another country just like they did Afghanistan. You know, most Americans still believe that Saddam Hussein was responsible, excuse me, responsible for taking down uh, 9-11, uh, taking down the trade towers, the Twin Towers. And he had, of course, nothing to do with it. So they use war to get your mind off a terrible economy. And that's what I believe is going to happen. When all else fails, they take you to war. And you look at you know, the United States. I mean, here we have a Nobel Peace Prize winning president that starts the Libyan war, overthrows a, a country, a sovereign nation that did nothing to us, destroy the entire, the entire country. It's created radicalism. They're still fighting in Iraq, over a million dead. So it'll be very easy to start a war. All you have to do is start screaming that they're selling ISIS down in Washington and everybody will be up in arms. Again, one terrorist strike is all it takes. Well, the United States has our police force so entangled around the world and we're, of course, on the ground in uh, probably around 100 countries, but we're actively at war in a few of those in the Middle East. Have you identified if the war would continue in the Middle East, or have you located places maybe in Asia or Europe that, that we could end up uh, battling against if this uh, 2016 depression hits and gets worse? Well, one of them is, you were talking also, to answer your question, I didn't, uh, about civil war in the United States. Yes, you're seeing it already uh, heating up. And it's going to be, it have racial overtones as well. So again, when, when, when people lose everything, as we used to say in the Bronx, when people lose everything and have nothing left to lose, they lose it. And that's what, you know, you, you, look, if you were an Iraqi or you were Afghan, and a foreign nation came in and destroyed your country, killed everybody that you love. Nobody's left. Your country's destroyed. You're in your 20s. All you've known all your life is destruction. You think you'd become radicalized? Now bring that home. Everybody, why do you think Trump and Sanders, I mean, not why do you think, I mean, why, everybody knows. The reason people are going to both of them is because they're, they're anathema to the system. They're the antithesis of it. And that's why they, so the, 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 it's ready to explode. At home, abroad, I would suggest two places to look at. One, Saudi Arabia. By the way, they just got their credit rating downgraded by Fitch. They, got a, they need oil at $100 a barrel to break even. And now they're murdering people all over Yemen and they're expanding their, of course, they're very responsible for what's going on in Syria as well. But their economy's going down, as are other countries in the Middle East, these so-called royal nations. You know how they came, you know how they got kings, right? A princess kissed the frog, and the frog became a king. They're dictatorships. They're ruthless monarchies, the beheaders in chief. And then you have that guy over there in Turkey, but I don't want to say anything bad about him because he's this guy over there in Germany, a comedian. They're ready to bring him up on charges for saying that the premier he did a, a skit, a comedian, that, that Erdogan over there was having sex with sheep. Yeah, so that's got him in trouble now. And the German country, the German government may actually prosecute him. So going around the world. Turkey is in decline, way overexpanded. They're moving into Iraq. They're moving into Syria. They're, they're killing the Kurds. Oh, I can't say that. that they're, they're shooting militants. That's it. Yeah. And when bomb drops on innocent people, it was collateral damage like the United States does. So it's okay. The other big one to watch is Ukraine. That little boy, Yatsenyuk, all you have to do is go on YouTube, put Victoria Newland in there, and, and uh, Jeffrey Pyatt, our ambassador to Ukraine, and people might remember that 
cell phone intercept that they got when she was telling Pyatt when they were overthrowing the democratically elected government of Yanukovych that they wanted their boy was Yats. Yeah, Yats, a little boy, the rabbit. This cat's out now. Poroshenko just got involved with the Panama Papers. He's hiding his dough over there. His popularity rating now is below 20%. They're deep in debt. They need another $17 billion from the IMF, and they're not going to give it to them. So what's going to happen? The explosion in Ukraine, and you know what will happen? They'll blame the Russians. And you're already seeing NATO build up on the Russian borders and more in Ukraine. You're seeing Poland become more and more antagonistic toward Russia. So they won't blame it on the people that caused the coup, the United States and Germany. No, they'll blame it on Russia. So that's the other hot spot. So the three hot spots for world war are the Middle East, of course, Turkey involved in that, and now Ukraine. What goes on in Somalia, Congo, those places, although they're slaughtering people in Mali and the United States and their allies are involved in that, people don't care about that. They, 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 their skin's too dark down there. They don't, they don't rate a high rating. on the. You could kill them, they don't count. They don't count as much as, oh, look, they just bombed a, 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 a market over there in Yemen. Yeah, killed 119 people. Days, 119 dead Yemeni civilians. Don't count for one dead Frenchman, one dead European, or one dead American. So, that's where it's going. Because with the hypocrites, that the prostitutes, these little boys and girls with just disgusting human beings, like, well, they're prostitutes. They get paid off to sp spread propaganda and lies they frame the stories that they want. So what goes on in Africa won't count that much. And by the way, a big problem also in South Africa because of the mining, the, the, the raw material prices down, as in Brazil. That's the other one. Brazil's ready to go, Venezuela. So you're looking at, it doesn't have to be one big explosion. It could be an implosion. Venezuela is on the cusp. And so is Brazil. And Brazil's now in, in, a, in a recession, the worst that they have had in 100 years. It's not going to get better because so much of their, the raw materials, between 40 to 45% are gobbled up by China, which is now can't eat any more raw materials. Matter of fact, they're pushing out steel and they're driving down the prices because they have so much overproduction. All right, Gerald. Well, let's move on to the elections. What a comedy it's all been. You've got Hillary leading on the Democrat side and almost certain to clench the nomination, but Bernie's given her a good fight. And then you've got Cruz versus Trump on the Republican side, and Trump is looking less likely to, to clench the required 1,200 or so delegates needed, meaning a contended convention could be in the cards. What do you think is going to happen with the result of the elections here? This was our... Trends Journal a year ago. Liars, cowards, freaks, and fools, welcome to the presidential reality show. That was two months before Trump, a real reality show champion, threw his uh, hat into the ring and became a contestant. We see it going like this. A Clinton-Sanders ticket. Hillary Clinton has very negative ratings and personality. And what Bernie Sanders is doing, he's playing the Obama card, even to the level where his campaign slogan mirrors Obama's. Change you can believe in. If you could change, you could believe in from Obama. I got a bridge in Brooklyn I could sell you. And Bernie's selling the same BS with a future to believe in. But he's winning over the millennials. Trump has such a negative, even if he wins, if Cruz wins, he'll go nowhere. We, we, we made the forecast, actually, in the Trends Journal, again, over a year ago. And, and it still holds, even though uh, Trump is in the race. And matter of fact, it magnifies the point. 
if the election were held today and Hillary Clinton survives the Castro scandal, uh, a Castro influence scandal, we forecast Clinton as the winner on issues of gay rights, women's rights, and abortion. Cruz, Paul, Rubio, Carson, Fiorina, and Huckabee will find weak support among a sizable portion of women voters. With all the candidates, including Clinton, on the same war page, and none presenting strong and unique economic policies to truly create jobs and increase wages, what separates Clinton from the guys is the girls. And we go on to point out that over 10 million more women vote than men, and that Trump has a 73% negative rating among women, particularly when he just when he came out about a week and a half ago and said that if abortions were illegal in the United States, the woman that got the abortion would have to be punished for getting it. That was the end for him. He already had a long anti-woman platform building up. So that's the end of it for him. Again, it's, as we see it, Sanders is a great you know, bait out there to sucker in the millennials. And I got to, you know, they, 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 this whole Sanders thing, this guy's a fraud, man. All you have to go to truth, they go to other places. I voted against the Iraq war. And with the money that we save from the Iraq war, you'll get free education. Yeah, that Bernie, save your, save your Brooklyn Kenosha Act. I grew up in the Bronx. I've seen it before. You're full of crap. You voted for Bill Clinton's bombing and destruction of Iraq when you were congressman, Bernie, B.S. Bernie, you voted for the sanctions that Clinton put on Iraq and over 500,000 Iraqi children under the age of five were dead because they couldn't get medical supplies of food, according to the UN, and Madeleine Albright, that lovely secretary of state under Clinton, when asked by Leslie Stahl, on CBS 60 Minutes said it was worth the price. Oh, Bernie, you voted for the Yugoslav destruction by Bill Clinton, and Bernie, you got people arrested for protesting it, Bernie. Oh, Bernie, you love that Afghan war, didn't you? I voted against the Iraq war. Hey, Bernie, you voted to fund it as you did to fund all the other military budgets. One, oh, and Bernie, you love those F-35s that you want to bring into the Burlington, Air For- the Burlington Airport up there in Vermont, don't you? Huh? Yeah, you love those F-35s, that $1.5 trillion debacle. He's full of crap. He's a little nobody that never worked a day in his life working on some little BS newspaper, local paper, and has been sucking off the public tit the rest of his life. He's a fraud. He'll bring in the votes to Hillary because she has such a negative rating. So it's a perfect combination. Hillary and a fraud. Well, Gerald, I was going to say, I, I personally uh, do not vote, so I kind of watch all of this from the outside and I don't get too attached to any one candidate. But, uh, you know, as much as a populist as Trump is and a self-interested, pompous jerk, uh, it's kind of fun to watch him make a a total joke of the political system that has become, uh, you know, democracy in the United States. Is there not some part of you that loves watching what Trump is doing? I'm delighted that Trump got into the presidential reality show. He showed what a fraud the whole thing is, and look what he did to the, quote, party. He left it in shambles, the Republican Party. There's nobody there, the Republican elite. What elite? Look at these little boys and girls. What? Mitch McConnell? Lindsey Graham? McCain? What was that guy, Paul Ryan? Didn't that guy Paul Ryan play Eddie Munster? You know, the Munsters? I mean, they're a bunch of nobodies. So Trump, I love what Trump did in terms of showing what a whole fraud this whole system is. All right, Gerald. Well, I really appreciate you always coming on the show and sharing your insights and the trends you've identified. If you don't mind, if you could take a few seconds to share uh, different places that our listeners can go to find your content and subscribe to uh, the Trends Journal moving forward, that would be great. 
Yes, trendsresearch.com, trendsresearch.com. And not only do we have the Trends Journal, we also put out a Trends Monthly, a Trend Alert each week. We have Trend in the News broadcasts each weekday night. And, you know, we put our money where our heart is. We also launched OccupyPeace.us. Go to that site as well, OccupyPeace.us. And it's a movement to honor the founding fathers, beginning with George Washington, who opposed foreign entanglements, and the world was at war big time back then, as well as Madison, Adams, Jefferson, all, all the founding fathers were against foreign entanglements. Close down those bases overseas, secure the homeland, put the troops to work rebuilding our third world infrastructure. Do you know, Colin, that the United States, when adjusted for inflation, has spent more money, quote, rebuilding Afghanistan than we had with the Marshall Plan after World War II. So, trendsresearch.com, we're trying to do our most in our fight for freedom, of, for peace, and the truth in trends. All right, well, Gerald Salente, everybody, he's the publisher of Trends Journal. You all know who he is. Gerald, thank you so much for coming on the program. Thank you, Tom. think you understand the junior mining sector and you think that the participants in the mining sector, junior mining sector, are good people and kind people, hit the bit. And the world is always going to need raw material. It's going to need copper and gold and nickel and so forth. Totally destabilized. Hey, hey, troll, did you hear what's going on in Yemen? Are you too stupid? Minority and 51% of the people are earning under $30,000 a year. So there is no recovery. The global equity markets are teetering. And you look at, you know what's really important, Colin, is to follow the money. And when I say that, look at bank stocks. In the States, bank stocks are down about 13%. They're coming out with new earnings and they stink. You look, go take a trip over to Europe. About 20% of the equity in the banks has gone into the energy sector. And the energy sectors are in trouble. But it's not only energy, it's shipping, because you've got to transport the stuff. And then you keep going on and on, and you look at exports numbers coming out of China. Look at steel prices. It's a global recession. All right, well, I want to ask you, what happens, Gerald, if a stock market crash does come? Uh, we had Robert Kiyosaki on the show a few months back, and he predicted the worst stock market crash in history would come in 2016. Uh, I don't know if that will be the case, but certainly the Federal Reserve cannot sit idly by watching as all their hard work comes crashing down. Well, here was the cover of our Trends Journal for the winter edition. came out, actually reported it first in December, the panic of 2016. And... The Federal Reserve can't do anything anymore other than more quantitative easing, zero interest from uh, not putting more oil into the market. So it has really nothing to do with the fundamentals of the economy. It has to do with manipulation. On the equity market front, I mean, just look what's going on. I mean, earlier this week, uh, the World Bank downgraded world growth. Then the IMF came out again, again, and again, and again keeps downgrading growth potential. There's a global recession going on, and people don't want to call it what it is. The markets are being juiced up, the equity markets, by negative interest rates, zero interest rate policy or thereabouts. And you look in the, in the States, for example, you're looking at the equity markets. They're buying up stock buybacks at about the tune of $60 billion a month. So the equity markets have gone up because of the stock buybacks, which is unprecedented at this level because they're borrowing the money for nothing, and merger and acquisition activity. End of story. And you could, these are the facts. In the States, 90%, 95% of the wealth created since quantitative easing and zero interest rate policy began back at the Great Recession has gone to 1%. And when you look at real wages and earnings in the states, the middle class is now on great policy, is not working, neither is quantitative easing. Take a look over in the European Central Bank. 
They increased um, uh, equity buying, bond buying, uh, not only corp uh, uh, government bonds, but s they're buying corporate bonds. That's called the merger of state and corporate powers. And back in Europe, Mussolini called it fascism. They just increased it from 60 billion euros a month to 80 billion. Yet you still have Europe, you know, barely growing and, and, and most of the, the southern countries really in recession. So there's nothing really that the Federal Reserve can do anymore other than shoot blanks. And of course, they will try something. They come up with new schemes undreamed of. I mean, here we are talking negative interest rates. I mean, in the history of the world, there's never been such a thing. They're making this stuff up as they're going along. And who does it hurt? It hurts we, the little people. Because as I mentioned, all that cheap money allows stock buybacks and mergers and acquisitions so the big could get bigger, fatter, and filthier rich. Where does it hurt the people? How about pension funds? How about savings accounts? You have nowhere to put your dough anymore because they're paying you nothing or you have to pay them to keep it there. So going back to the crash, yeah, there's a strong possibility of a crash and that's why we're bullish on gold. And our forecast for gold is this. Gold needs to move to $1,400 an ounce. That means it has to stay strong above the 1270, 1280, 1290 mark to move into the 1300 level. When it hits 1400 and stabilizes above that, flirting with, you know, 1480, 1460, even 1440, the next hit for us is the $2,000 range because we believe there's going to be a spike in gold when gold prices go up because what gold is is a safe haven asset. It has since the beginning of the written word and it's not going away because Warren Buffett doesn't like it. It's bigger than Buffett, but I know the guy got billions, so hey, take it easy. Yeah, gold's been around forever. It's not going anywhere, and the central banksters could try to bring it down as much as they want, and money junkies that need the, the monetary you know, stimulation, the cocaine and the heroin addiction in, in money form so they could keep their Ponzi scheme going, it's going to die just as the addict dies. That's all this is. It's an addiction, an addiction fed by a criminal group that the people like to call the Palisade Radio is brought to you by First Majestic Silver Corp, one of the world's purest and fastest growing silver mining companies. Welcome back to another episode of Palisade Radio and returning on the show with us today is a favorite of our listeners, Mr. Gerald Salente, publisher of the Trends Journal. Gerald, welcome back to the program. Oh, thanks for having me back. Trends are all about identifying the major movements, shifts, or changes around the world, and 2016 has certainly ushered in a new environment whereby we've seen the stock market beginning to top off and the negatively correlated commodities market, which of course has been in turmoil the last three or four years, uh, particularly the precious metals, have at the same time shown a pretty strong move upwards, indicating a bottom is in place. Do you see a major shift in these markets happening in 2016? Well, on the gold market, the precious metals, uh, it's interesting. It's, uh, gold is up probably about 18 uh, percent since the start of the year. Well, most other the commodities, well, they're going up now, but mostly down. I mean, oil's moving up, but that's really based upon whether or not they could keep production where it is and 